Hello, uh, welcome everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce today Andras Kraft, who is now a Marie Skodowska Curie uh, Fellow at the University of Vienna. Before Vienna, he was an assistant professor at the American University of Central Asia, and then a postdoctoral fellow at the Steger Center for Hellenic Studies at Princeton University. Um, Andras received his PhD in, in 2018 from CU, Central European University, then in Budapest from the Medieval Studies Department and works broadly on Byzantine intellectual history um, in general and apocalyptic literature in particular. Andras has published broadly on these topics and you can find his articles on his Academia Edu page. For a light introduction, have a look at his reviews book reviews who tend to be um, review articles. Happy to have him here today. Andras, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dan. And thank you for the introduction and the invitation. Now, what I want to do today in this morning is to present a work in progress um, about an idea of how to interpret developments in late 11th century Constantinople. Let me begin by sharing my PowerPoint and then I assume you see the PowerPoint. We do. Very good. Um, and let me start not in the 11th century, but in the second century with the ancient Greek philosopher with the late antique Greek philosopher Celsus, who wrote a powerful refutation against Christianity, the so-called true word or the alith alithis logos. And one of his arguments draws up in the apparent contradictions in, um, between the Old and the New Testament. To quote Celsus on the screen in the translation by Joseph Hoffman, the Jews teach God's vengeance on their enemies, but Jesus advises that someone who has been struck should be should volunteer to be struck again. Well, who is to be disbelieved? Moses or Jesus? End of quote. Kelsos points to the apparent contradiction between the expectation of retributive justice, God's vengeance, on the one hand, and the prospect of boundless clemency, Christ's meekness, on the other. The antagonism between these two notions is so self-evident that it would be difficult, if possible at all, to harmonize them. How could anyone be righteous and at the same time be merciful? Now let us have a closer look at these two different paradigms. God's um, vengeance and justice can be found throughout Old Testament prophetic books. The tradition was continued in the New Testament, in particular in the book of Revelation, which couldn't be more explicit about God's judgment. Now the book of Revelation is remarkably silent on the duration of God's punishment. So we have to look somewhere else. For instance, to the Gospel of Matthew, where we read in the King James translation, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous go into life eternal. Now the key term here is aeonion. What does aeonion mean here? Or more precisely, how long does aeonion last? The retributionist camp came to favor the reading that aeonion means forever without an end. But there were critics. Some objected that an endless punishment without end would not really be fair. After all, true justice needs to impose punishments that are appropriate to the committed transgressions. And since man's sins are limited by nature, so should the punishments be limited as well. Moreover, critics pointed to God's omnipotence and philanthropy and inferred that God can achieve anything, including the salvation of all sinners. God uses punishments, not in a retributive, but in a therapeutic way. Eventually, God will show mercy to all and all will be saved. This is the theory of universal salvation, which is associated with the key term apocatastasis. Apocatastasis meaning restoration or restitution. Now, the theory is essentially rooted in the writings of the Apostle Paul. And Ilaria Ramelli has traced the patristic reception of this theory and has shown how popular and widespread it was until it was declared a heresy in the sixth century. Now the exact motivations and mechanics of this 
condemnation are still being debated. What is clear is that the Emperor Justinian in the mid sixth century intervened into an ever widening debate within the universalist um, camp and declared the theory itself to be anathema, banned. And following the sixth century condemnations, universal salvation, a theory that was associated with, with origin of Alexandria to school, lost traction and went underground. Now the history of the apocatastasis theory thereafter in the Byzantine period still has to be written. And one chapter in this history will likely be about the 11th and 12th centuries, when this now heresy of universal salvation re-emerges. We have a number of texts that revisit the issue and reinforce the earlier condemnations. For example, we have the dogmatic panoply by Ephthemia Zigavinos, who wrote a work around 11, um, 1110, which refutes 28 key heresies, including the heresy of universal salvation. We have an anonymous short discussion in a single manuscript from Oxford that attacks the originist notion of spiritual resurrection, which is associated with universal salvation. The text has been edited by Elias Pontikos, who ascribes the text to the circle of Michael Tselos. So the second half of the 11th century. From the mid 12th century, we have the work by Nicholas of Methoni, who wrote his Anaptixis, his refutation of the elements of theology by Proclus, in which he refutes not only Proclus, but also Origen. At least twice, Nicholas argues against universal salvation. And most importantly, we have the Synodicon of Orthodoxy, a liturgical document that originally celebrated the restoration of icon veneration in the mid ninth century, but in the 11th century, um, additional commemorative layers were being added, among them 11 condemnations against the philosopher John Italus. A good portion of these 11 condemnations are eschatological in content. Let us have a quick look at the most important ones. The fourth anathema against Italus um, gives an anathema to those who teach that heaven and earth and other creatures are everlasting without beginning and will remain without change. And anathema also to those who contradict Christ in saying that heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. This passage is from the apocalyptic section in the Gospel of Matthew. Italus is said to have denied the end of the world, the apocalypse. In anathema nine, we're being told that those who say that the final and common resurrection will happen in other bodies, not in the bodies that we currently have, but in other bodies, those are also to be anathematized. And in anathema 10, we are told that also those are banned who accept and transmit that there's an end to punishment and a new restitution, a new apocatastasis. Now, Italus stands accused of having denied the end of the world, the bodily resurrection, and the eternity of punishments. In effect, Italus is said to have gone against the whole Christian tradition as it was perceived in the 11th century. Now, there has been much debate about the veracity of these and other accusations. I favor a balanced approach that takes them neither at face value nor reduces them to mere top one. In my view, the charges, including those we just looked at, are the deliberately oversimplified statements of what Italus actually taught. What did Italus teach? Our best source for his teachings is a compilation of 93 miscellaneous notes and treatises entitled Aporia Calesis, Questions and Answers. There are a number of chapters in this compilation that reveal Italus' eschatology. And I want to focus here on only two, chapter 32 and 50. In chapter or question 36, Italos argues that only the human intellect is immortal. He rejects Plato's reasoning that the soul is immortal because it is self-moving and life-giving. Among others, he says that if the soul is a life-giving principle, it will extend throughout the whole body. It will render all parts of our body alive, including our toes and our hair, 
That means that the soul extends throughout the body and is dependent on the three-dimensional extension of it. But the three-dimensional quality of the soul precludes its incorruptibility because whatever is complex, for example, extended, can be broken down and thus perish. In contrast to the composite nature of the soul, the intellect, the noose, is undivided and completely independent of the body. Thus, Italos follows Aristotle in holding that our rational and intellectual faculty is immortal. In question 50, he reiterates, he reiterates, he repeats the notion that only the rational part of the soul is immortal, and he examines the thorny issue of whether it is possible for the diseased to experience any kind of advancement, pedosis or anabasis after death. This is an old and tricky issue with wide ranging implications because it involves the question whether prayers, almsgiving and the like can affect the dead or not. Now, Italo says that no motion or change, no ascent, should be possible after the dissolution of the body after death. Sinners themselves are not able to influence the post-mortem fate and reduce any impending punishment. But he allows for two exceptions. Exception one is that maybe the living, those who are still in a the body, they can support the disease through benefactions, prayers, almsgiving, fasting, and the like. The second option seems to allow for the spiritual advancement of the dead through God's philanthropy. This is a bit tricky and the argument has to be read in context. Throughout the second half of chapter 50, Italos characterizes every argument that supports the post-mortem advancement of the dead as either absurd or blasphemous, except one. And this argument draws up in a theory of universal salvation. The argument holds that God's philanthropy can ensure all creatures to be advanced and saved, including the demons. Italos does not explicitly reject this argument. He leaves that to the reader to think, oh, it's an absurd idea. But if one looks closely, it doesn't seem to be very absurd because throughout his other works, Italos repeats that our bodily nature is only a temporary condition of the fall from paradise that the soul will eventually return to its divine source, and that we will resurrect in spiritual bodies, given that essentially we are intellect, and that is the part that is immortal in us, and an intellect does not need a core, a carnal, a carnal uh, vehicle. These are all notions associated with the theory of universal salvation. Italus concludes this treatise by saying, and I quote, Therefore, it has been clearly shown what progress is and of whom and of which part of the soul it occurs, namely the intellect, um, to which it occurs and due to which causes there is and is not an ascent. That is, Italos says that only a part of the soul, that is the intellect, will experience post-mortem advancement and the advancement can happen only due to specific reasons, which is God's philanthropy. In order to understand what was at stake and what was Italus actually doing, we have to look at his audience. Question 50 or chapter 50 was addressed to Emperor Michael VII. It starts with a dedication to the emperor. I give here in the, in the slide. He tacitly endorsed universal salvation and correspondence to the emperor. And this is not the only time he did that. We have another text by Italos, chapter 86, which, in which he discusses the resurrection. Now the title of this chapter, as given a manuscript transmission, reads in translations, how will we resurrect with our own rough and material bodies? He essentially argues here, tacitly again, for a spiritual resurrection. Now Italos wrote a commentary on dialectics which he dedicated to the co-emperor Andronicus Ducas, the brother of the emperor Michael Ducas. The introduction of this commentary refers to an earlier work in which Italo spoke in here, quote, about the resurrection and how the dead are able to rise with these very bodies, unquote. The reference in this introduction to on dialectics resembles the title of Question 86, 
Italo seems to refer to this earlier work of his. That is, we at least have two writings that Italo's addressed to the imperial court in which he had discussed personal eschatology, the fate of the soul after death, and the court was listening. His influence and his teachings around aroused suspicion. Italos was put on trial in 1076, but as we are told, he was acquitted because the Emperor Michael VII put his helping hand over him. He was put on trial again in 1082, and at that time, he was condemned. Now, what was at stake in the universalist position of Italos and the circle? I think there are three main implications, an ethical, an economical, and a political implication. With regard to the first, Epiphanius of Salamis in the late fourth century pointed out that a spiritual resurrection, the separation of the body from the soul as universalists teach, jeopardizes moral accountability. After all, how could the soul be punished for the sins that the body had committed? The body has to resurrect together with the soul for both parts to be equally accountable. Now, without the accountability in the afterlife, anarchy would break loose. Moreover, if everyone were to be saved, then all differentiation based on merit would be rendered void. Demons and angels would be equal. Epiphanius argued that an apocatastasis eschatology destroys the traditional fabric of society. In contrast, proper Christian ethics depend on the doctrines of the bodily resurrection and everlasting punishment. Similarly, Emperor Justinian, in his letter to Patriarch Minas, argued that, and here I quote, those who say these things regarding universal salvation make men lazy, careless about fulfilling God's commandment. It leads to moral decadence. There's another implication. Universal salvation can call into question the established practices of debt cancellation and debt redistribution. If all sins are essentially moral debts and they will be forgiven by God, then why should one observe one's debt obligation in this life? Adherents of the apocatastasis could have argued that the eschatological paradigm of debt cancellation should be implemented already on earth. They could have cited the parable of the unforgiving servant from the Gospel of Matthew which argues that debt that, that cancellation starts with the king and trickles down through society. If this biblical admonition had been put into practice, it could have impacted the imperial fiscus and called into question the market of penitential services that includes commemorative liturgies, prayers, and other actions that served as a so-called afterlife insurance policy. I do not know any source that actually makes this claim, but it is not necessary that the argument was made expresses verbis. What matters is that universalists could have made it, which made their eschatology a threat. And finally, there is a political implication. An all merciful God provides a very different ideal of rulership than a judging God. Again, if God forgives all sins, then the emperor should forgive all debts the emperor would be little more than a laissez-faire leader. Alexis Komnenos, who came to power in 1081 and who initiated a second trial against Italos, was of a different kind. We know that he commissioned a large mural painting in the imperial palace, which depicted the second coming with Christ passing judgment on the same thing. The painting is lost, but we have a poem by the court physician and poet Nicholas Caliclis who describes it. The poem testifies to what Alexius saw in Christ. He saw the heavenly righteous judge, not the merciful sacrificial lamb. Alexius knew the image of the divine judge, which he could emulate as Christ's typological precursor. In addition, Alexius Koninos was a usurper who lacked legitimacy. One way of gaining legitimacy was to argue teleologically by claiming that his actions, his usurpation, his suppression of rebellions and the like, were needed in preparation of the second coming. 
That is, he projected into the presumably near future the retroactive justification of his own. He used the apocalyptic frame of reference to gain legitimacy. In fact, he had a sort of an apocalyptic aura. The historian Zonaras relates in a well-known passage that Alexius believed the prediction by certain monks who had told him that he would fulfill the pseudo-methodian prophecy to abdicate in Jerusalem. His own daughter, Anna Komnini, depicted him decades later as the last Constantine and as an apocalyptic warrior who defeated almost single-handedly multitudes of enemies. The teleological and proleptic orientation of Alexis' ideology could be called into question by universal salvation because the apocatastasis, the restitution of all, mitigates the efficacy and purpose of the last judgment. If all will be saved in the end, why should one care about judgment then? And if the significance of the last judgment is mitigated, then the empress appeal to it too. Put differently, Italy's eschatology was seen to delegitimize Alexius' usurpation since it inhibited the proleptic, the proleptic justification of the new emperor. In conclusion, John Italus and Emperor Alexius I held two divergent views on eschatology. Italus and his circle endorsed the philosophical theory of universal salvation while Alexius and his faction promoted the apocalyptic paradigm of retributive justice. From Alexius' point of view, the two paradigms were incompatible. The apocatastasis mitigates the significance of the last judgment and thus can cause social, economic, and political enemies. For Italus in contrast, the two paradigms were compatible. He taught that the consummation of the world and the last judgment from part and parcel of salvation history. He makes this explicit in question 71, in which he refutes the eternity of the world. He's explicit about there will be an end of this world. However, the last judgment does not establish the ultimate end, but only represents a preliminary stage towards universal salvation. Italy's eschatology could have been capable of promoting a compromise. God, the righteous judge, will realize the apocalyptic prophecies, whereafter God, the merciful father, will realize his limitless philanthropy. Italy would have answered to Celsus that both Moses and Jesus were right. In the end, Italos lost to the hardliners, to the retributionists, who had no interest in resolving the cognitive dissonance that Italos, sorry, that Kelsos, had pointed his finger at. So in a sense, the accusation voiced in the Synodicon of Orthodoxy and the Anacomini that Italos used too much logic, too much dialectic in his work seems correct. Italos tried to resolve a problem that did not need any solving. Thank you for your attention. I'm gladly taking questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Andras, for this very interesting presentation about Italos and Apocatastasis. Um, now we open the Q&A session. So if you have questions, please write them in the chat or raise your hand. And uh, um, I will be happy to um, let you speak. If there are no questions, I have one. Um, so I don't know Italos at all, but I work with an author who is Isaac of Nineveh, who uh, also embraced the idea of the apocatastasis. Uh, so I have two questions about that. Uh, so the first is at the beginning, you quoted these two uh, passages. Uh, in the first, um, it speaks of the rational and intellectual faculty, like logistica dianetica. Um, and then you mentioned news. So does he, how do you articulate these two uh, elements? Like it's a change of position or for him, the news includes these two faculties? That's my first question. And then I have another one, but maybe later. 
I think in that particular um, passage, he uses the loiki ke, um, the anoitiki, the intellectual and the rational faculty as synonyms for the nous. Two, two aspects of the same nous. Okay. Now, it's interesting because uh, basically there is a person of the author I study who is Syriac, so it has not the philosophical background of uh, like mm -hmm. a, a your author, of course, and at least he's a spiritual author, but he thinks that uh, what will stay at the end is just the noetic faculty in the sense of intuitive and the rational in the sense of composite will not uh, be there at the end in the final stage of contemplation. So that was just uh, out of my curiosity, but probably it's a huge issue uh, in Italy, so I don't know. Um, yeah. What exactly remains? Um, yeah. The, the, the difficulty is that Italos well knows that universal salvation and the terminology associated with it is anathema. He knows it. So he cannot really say everything directly. He has some yeah. kind of parisia, some kind of liberty to speak to the court. The emperor and the co-emperor were students, but he still has to watch his, his um, wording. Plus there may be editorial changes in the manuscript transmission too. Um, I think he just sticks here with impeccable um, language and not go into too much speculation about which exact function, the noetic, the noetic of the intellect will actually right. remain till the end and then be unified with the Godhead. So here, I just think that these two terms are being used as um, shorthand references to the news. While there is more to say about this, he avoids doing this at that point. Right, okay, thank you very much, thank you. Maybe for the other question, I can uh, wait and uh... I will reward this uh, here in the chat. Uh, it's uh, Laura Hunt who writes, if only the intellect is in eternal, are there any gender consequences? Women have not always been taught to have intellect or maybe not much, but then maybe Italos didn't address that. I don't know if you, uh, Laura, you want also to jump in and uh, expand on this. Um, I can answer, I can expand if it's not clear, but... Um... I think maybe the question is clear. Well, it is clear. It is difficult. A gender mm -hmm. aspect in um, Italos, difficult. I haven't found any gender aspect. And how much misogyny do we expect? That's the question. Um, yes, that's, that's really something that is a blind spot in research. Yeah, I'm, I'm just always that. curious how some 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 of the ancient people kind of worked that out as they as they were were dealing with some of their assumptions, you know. And sometimes they just don't even really pay attention to it, so um, it's not on, on their radar, so to speak. But then sometimes they do, so it's just interesting to me. I think it was on his radar since he was in the imperial court and the empress um, Alexios right hand and real. The mentor was his mother. She was a second mm. Helen, like Constantine and Helen, um, Alexius and his um, mother Anna, was really a patron of the emperor. And then his daughter, Anna Komnini, that's a few decades later, will advance a forceful um, argumentation for the, let's say, intellectual empowerment of women through her workshop of translation and historical works. So Italos was surrounded by powerful women before and after. So how he related to this, I do not know. I do not see any misogynist yeah. indications or instances at this point in Italos. Oh, interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Do we have other questions? Um, if we don't, I will there, ask my there is a question. There is a question from Jonathan Zeker. Okay, please, Jonathan. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, oh, this is this is really really interesting. I I, I want to formulate this right. I, I is there is there is there is part of the issue that emerges uh, with Alexios 
uh, a conflict between conceptions that are possible in an individual eschatology and conceptions that are necessitated by a more corporate eschatology. That is the last judgment. You know, you put the last judgment at stake. I, a universalist would easily be able to answer the last judgment is the moment of final restitution. It's not the the penultimate. It's simply the the moment at which everything does come to an end because the pain has been suffered. There's plenty of uh, pure aeonion, right? There's plenty of eternal or non-eternal fire to go through. So I, I wonder if if one looks at the fate of an individual soul, one can arrive at a more universalist position without sacrificing the uh, the expectation of, of needing to work hard towards salvation or of abiding by societal standards, but that if one takes a more corporate view, and it is interesting that Alexios has this sense of being the, the messianic fulfillment of the pseudo-methodian apocalypse, which is highly political and corporate in its in its uh, take on eschatology. Um, if one takes that tack, does, does one end up in a different position? So effectively, is there is there a sense in which the ways in which universalists can make sense of their theology only work for the individual, and they don't necessarily work so well for a corporate view. Um, just a speculation that emerged from your paper, which was very, very interesting. So thank you. I'd be curious what you think. Difficult, but excellent question. Um, I would answer it as such that the levels of a political, the levels of um, forcefulness of the political implication depends on how corporate or how individualist one goes with an universalism. I think, by, um, judging by the fact that Italos was silenced, he was sent to a monastery as far as we're told, he may have been later rehabilitated, but never as an intellectual. He was never rehabilitated as an intellectual, maybe as a clerk at most. So um, he was not, um, he was not silenced with utmost violence. He was shut up. Now that kind of reaction for me would suggest that his um, eschatology was not as threatening as other, as other eschatologies. A few decades later, we would have Basil de Bogomir, which is much more corporate eschatology, as you phrase it. And he was torched. He was scorched in the Hippodrome in front of um, the Constantinopolitan populace watching him being torched because he was adamantly refusing to renounce his heresy. Now that was a political, if not treasonous um, heresy that had to be dealt with killing. Italos was not killed, he was shut up. So that is one aspect that I think indicates that what he was about was personal eschatology much more then. It still had ramifications, but it was not, they were not as dangerous to the system or to in particular, um, the, the new dynasty of Alexius than other challenges had been. At the same time, I think that Alexius is very careful about this because we have a lacuna of apocalyptic texts in the communion period. We know from Anacomeni, especially from Honiatis um, in the 13th century, looking back at the 12th century, that prophecies were very, very popular. There was an upsurge in prophecy making and prophecy reading, but we don't really have them. Now, why don't we have them? Um, one possible way is because of censorship. Because Alexius and his um, successors were very knowledgeable of the fact that corporate eschatology can become very dangerous for the, um, for the dynasty, those to have to be persecuted. But again, Italos was shut up, he was not persecuted, he was not killed, which suggests that his eschatology was as problematic as it was, it was not considered treason. It was considered uncomfortable. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have other two questions uh, on the, in, um, in the chat. I would invite Margaret and Artemy to speak uh, directly of their questions. If they can, if they cannot, I will read it. So Margaret, do you want to jump in the discussion. Okay, this, this was just um, very much a sideline, but you were talking about um, Anna Komnena uh, being very forceful about the intellectual, or, or having written something about the intellectual capacities of women. And I would just like to know, I would like a bibliography 
Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully it has been translated somewhere. I can't imagine anything about the intellectual capacity of women would not by now have been translated, but I have not heard of this before. Thank you. I, I will have to think about this because the first argument is her history in and of itself, that she makes this yeah, yeah, first yeah. woman, of course, then her intellectual circle um, that translated um, works of Aristotle, but also the uh, funeral oration dedicated to Anna Komnini um, points out that she was, um, I think if I remember well, more than just a woman, in a sense that, that she mm -hmm. was an intellectual champion. So um, I have to look into what translations we have. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Artemi? Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask about the astrological background uh, of uh, uh, the apocatastasis, uh, the, the, the debate about it, and so on and so on. Uh, I recall that uh, Simon Sif, who is regarded to be one of the leading uh, astrologers of uh, this era, uh, used to quote uh, Philoponus. And Philoponus, uh, as we know, was uh, one of the first scholars to question the uh, Aristotelian th theory of uh, the eternity of the world. So probably there was some uh, connection or a debate between uh, Italus and Sif and uh, mm, some, uh, 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 probably there was a debate about uh, um, the eternity of the world between the intellectuals then, that uh, then uh, became a political issue. What do you think about that? The eternity of the world was in everyone's mouth at that time. Why exactly and how? I don't understand it yet, but Philoponus is a key element in this. And you're right, Simeon Seath seems to be the first um, who, let's say, reintroduces Philoponus into the discourse. Now, he knew Arabic and Greek, uh, working in Antioch. So Simeon Seath is a catalyst in the wider intellectual trend. We have then Michael Salos, Salos we have John Italos, they all quote, um, um, and use arguments by Philoponus against the eternity of the world. It was a fashionable topic in the late 11th century. Then it ceases to be in the 12th century, was silenced probably because of the condemnation of Italos, that we don't deal with physics at this moment, with the eternity of the world, which belongs to physics, we don't deal with this anymore. But at the same time, it becomes a very forceful argument in the <clears throat> Islamic world. Al-Ghazali, the Persian philosopher, starts his refutation of philosophies, his tahafut al-falsafa, with um, the non-eternity of the world. He proves that the world is not eternal. It's the most important heresy, or most important um, mistake that the pagan philosophers have committed. So the eternity of the world is happening, is, is, is a new trendy philosophical problem. Eventually, it will move as a wave into the Latin West where it um, causes much, um, um, much concern also for the church in the 13th century in the Latin West. So yes, Philoponus seems to be re-emerging in the 11th century and with it, the discussion over the eternity of the world. What exactly sparked it? That has to be still researched. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have um, other questions? Adrian. Adrian. Um, yeah, hi, Andres. Just in connection to the last discussion, so to the last question, uh, in the anathemas in the sixth century, there was the issue of the um, uh, insoled character of the heavenly body. Um, so, you know, the discussion whether the sun and the moon have souls and which also will be uh, basically saved at the end. So I'm asking if, I'm wondering if Italos or in his period, this also is part of the issue, because it certainly was part of the issue in the sixth century and Philoponus actually also writes against this. So, um, yeah. I haven't come across it. Um, the unsolved nature of the heavenly bodies. The problem that I see and I haven't been able to solve yet is what is his 
stands on the world soul. Not the soul of the celestial bodies, but the soul of the world. Does the world have a soul? He says at one point that is blasphemous. We can't say that. We just investigate it for the sake of investigation. But the system, the theological system that he builds seems to require some sense of a world soul. What exactly that is? How he can square this as he identify with the Holy Spirit? All these things are elusive and I'm not sure yet exactly what he's trying to say. But there is an issue about the world soul, not about whether the sun has a soul or not. Thank you. I cannot see. Uh, yes, Dan, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. I, my, my question is uh, more general than that. Um, you mentioned that uh, this emperor would have used um, a prophetic discourse to, you know, wallow his activity in retroactively. And I imagine this is not the only emperor who um, produced a discourse, self-legitimizing discourse using prophetic or apocalyptic even imagery. Uh, how does uh, this emperor compare to others in this regard? Is he more prone to do that? Is it a main thingy of his time? Everyone was doing it. Um, I'm just curious how that goes. Thank you. The first layer of answer would be whenever a change happens, a profound change like a usurpation, um, with the idea of a new system behind it, because there was a usurpation before. Uh, Nikephoros III Votaniatis usurped the throne a few years earlier, but that was a short, short lived period. Alexis had the fortunes of staying on and establishing a dynasty. So we have his program more or less. We don't have Nikephoros' program because he reigned for so little time. Now, with the fortune of establishing a dynasty, his intentions become more clear. And to establish a new dynasty, to have such a radical change, a rupture in the, in a sense of an established linear genealogical line of rulership, one needs justification. And the apocalyptic paradigm or the apocalyptic reference is a convenient way. Did Nikephoros use it too? We don't know. Maybe he would have used it if he had stayed in power for another. 20 years, hard to tell. Um, in addition to this, it is not only the um, usurpation that justifies his recourse to the apocalyptic framework, but it's also the environment that he associated himself with. Now, Italos was put on trial six years before he was condemned. That is around already when he was still in Constantinople under imperial protection, there were circles that were um, opposing him. So there is a multiplicity of eschatological paradigms. I just chose two radical views that are extremist and that I think in the change to a new dynasty under Alexius came to the fore. But the factions existed before and Alexius chose to favor and to side with that faction that was retributionist. Other emperors when they usurp, they may have not favored that much the retributionists. Now, who are these retributionists? Hard to tell, but definitely some monks, whether it was monastic circles in of itself, I wouldn't overgeneralize it, but certain monastic circles were um, associated. As I mentioned, Alexis was told by monks that he would be the last emperor, one of the last emperors. Um, Anna Komnini, his daughter, is adamant that he always was surrounded by monks, especially in his earlier years. So there was um, a monastic input, a monastic faction that supported a retributionist reading of um, theology, in contrast to a universalist reading of theology, that Alexius used, tapped into, and that also um, in hindsight, empowered him. So it was the usurpation and the faction that stood behind him that conditioned him to use the apocalyptic framework. Very, very interesting. So others might have used it, but here we have a more developed case where 
but good reasons to do that and in using a background that was already there. Very interesting. It is also always a function of sources. We have good sources, relatively speaking, yeah. for the Byzantine period of the 11th and 12th century. Um, for earlier periods, we can speculate about Leo III um, in the 8th century and others that appear, but the evidence is so, so limited that it's more speculation. In the case of Alexis, I think an argument can be made that there is an apocalyptic horizon that he aspires to and that influences his legitimacy. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so maybe I can jump in with my uh, other questions. So uh, the first is, does he mention any patristic source um, uh, that inspires him in his views? And the other questions, maybe we can link them together is, uh, are there any reference to experience, like personal experience or other people in his milieu experience that he mentioned to support his views, or this is completely out of his more philosophical approach? Does he use, you mean Italos? Yes, he uses patristic authors, especially yeah. Gregory the Theologian and John of Damascus, um, the references or parallels of Maximus, the Confessor as well. Yes, he uses the, the classical, um, to be considered orthodox authors. Absolutely, okay. he uses them. Um, again, I think Idolos and his circle were pious Christians, but Christianity has different colors and shapes. So what he wanted to achieve is, in the reading I presented, a compromise that dissolves the cognitive dissonance that not everyone needed to see dissolved. Cognitive dissonance does have an amb ambivalence and ambiguity in general does have its advantages. Not everything should be flat and square. So he referred to the classics, to the authoritative authors, patristic authors, because he was, in my view, um, really interested in promoting a pious and uh, proper interpretation of eschatology. Right. And uh, does he mention also uh, references to experience of people or just uh, it's more like, I don't know, does it happen sometimes or uh, there's only or mostly like um, philosophical argumentation, let's say, or here and there experience jumps in? I don't know those personal experiences. I think it's a function of the text that we have. Yeah. Similar to what we have in Aristotle, we have his lecture notes. We don't have the published works like in Plato. In Plato, we don't have the unpublished works, the unwritten works, we don't have, we have the published works. In Aristotle, we have the lecture notes, but not what he published. In Italus, I think this, this situation is more like the Aristotelian corpus. It is somehow a collection of, uh, of works, some are commentary works, okay, but this compilation, this aporia calesis, the questions and answers compilation, it's a very weird work. Maybe it's the works that survived his condemnation. Maybe his works were burned, we don't know, but it could be that they were destroyed, discarded. And what we have is a compilation of what could be saved. Lecture notes. One work explicitly says our teacher, Italos. That is, that is, it was a work written not by Italos, but a lecture note from one of his students. And what Italos, what, what the works give are some letters, are some um, presentations, that rather fits a close um, school circle than something that would be designed for publication. Maybe that's why he is frank, but not overtly explicit. But I think he's <laughs> frank. That's why we believe what he wants to say, even though it's, it's, not, it's a bit hidden. It's a bit I hidden, see. it has to be excavated. But I think, that, again, the nature of the writings, which mostly are for internal esoteric use, um, do not necessitate such embellishments of um, everyday references. Okay, thank you. Then another question. Of the back of that, um, how is the manuscript transmission of this text on both sides of the debate? Do we have one um, witness hidden in a 
huge manuscript at the middle, or do we have 180 witnesses for each of them? How, how did that go? We have about 10, I think, 10 or so manuscripts. It's not very copious. We have tremendous, a tremendous, tremendous amount of microcellos, because in the, as Michel Trizio talked about this earlier, in the series, um, in the um, 13th century in particular, there was a copying move, a movement to, to reproduce cellos. But because Italos was condemned, probably that did not encourage the, the transmission of his works. The transmission, the manuscript seemed to um, reflect the condemnation to some degree. Sometimes the text is not, does not make much coherent sense. Sometimes there is a negation inserted where it shouldn't be. It doesn't make any sense in the flow of the argument. So I would say that at times the copyists or the compilers introduce um, emendations to the text or just scribal errors that are not very favorable to Italos. Um, so we still lack a critical edition. We have two and a half critical editions of Italo's work. The problem is that they were done by philologists with great merit. They did a, a, an outstanding job, but it has not been edited with a philosophical eye to it. And the latest author, Natalia Kajakmatsa, says so in a preface that it has to be appreciated and to be examined with a philosophical viewpoint as well. So philological work is not enough. One needs also the philosophical, and that is a tremendous amount of endeavor because one has to deal with the 10 plus manuscripts for the Aporia Calisi's work um, and actually try to reconstruct what is the most likely reading of it. We have luckily external evidence. Anna Komnini is not very helpful with regards to the content, but she gives indications. Um, we have the Synodicon condemnations that some of them I mentioned, and we have the trial record. The trial record of 1082, which gives us also some quotations um, of what Italos actually said with regard to his personal confession of faith, which are revealing as well. So there is a way to reconstruct, to reconstruct um, his eschatology and his philosophy, but there's always going to be some amount of um, openness to actually how did he resolve, how did he resolve certain minute details. For example, as Adrian asked, what was his position on the world soul? I don't see that he's explicit on this, but it may be, it has to be inferred from the system. So you're thinking if um, this critical edition would have, would be redone, it would be like a collaboration between a philosopher and a philologist, and what, how would that change the text? A couple of emendations or serious emendations to the text, like dropping uh, the negation where it shouldn't be something like that, a bit of local emendation, or are you thinking of more? I'm trying to imagine how that, what do you mean? Well, once we have um, a text, I say in order to have the text, we have to understand the system. And in order to understand the system, we have to understand first and foremost the sources. He quotes Gregory the theologian, John of Damascus, but um, there's much more behind it. For example, Simeon Seath. What is the tradition? Where does Philoponus come from? What does it amount to? What is the interrelationship with the school in Baghdad? He refers at one point, uh, Psellos quotes Italos in one point that he lamented that the real good philosophers, they, they are over there in Baghdad, they're Syrians, they're, they're um, Persians, let's say, um, Arab speaking Persians, that we have lost, Italos complained, the real excellence of philosophy in the Greek speaking world. He was very conscious about the fact that philosophy is not a national endeavor. So first one has to, or concomitantly, at the same time, one has to infer and reconstruct the historical context in which he worked, what sources did he have on his table. Then one has to um, reconstruct the system and then one can reconstruct adequately the text. And that is a very large project. For that very reason, I don't think, or I think for this reason, it was never been done. It makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any other uh, question or comment? Um, 
If we don't, um, I would like to thank again uh, Andras and uh, to thank also all of you who are here today. And uh, thank you again and see you uh, next time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Very good seeing everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting.